Hi, I'm Rick Steves. On this walk, we'll go from Dom Square, the bustling Times Square of Amsterdam, into the characteristic Jordan neighborhood. It's a pleasant, gentrified area, home to cafes, boutiques, bookstores, art galleries, and trendy residents. The tour begins. Dom Square. Dom Square is where the city was born. It was here that around the year 1250, they dammed the Amstel River to create Amstel Dam. The original residents settled east of here, in the neighborhood now known as the Red Light District. But as Amsterdam grew from a river-trading village to a worldwide sea-trading empire, the population needed new housing developments. Canal by canal, they created new neighborhoods of waterways lined with merchants' townhouses. This is the area we'll be walking through in the first half of our tour. By the 1600s, Amsterdam's golden age, they needed still more land they opened up a new development further west, the Jordaan. It was serviced by the church to the west, the Vesterkirk, which we'll see. Up ahead, the Magna Plaza was built in 1899. Like so many buildings in this soggy city, it was constructed atop a foundation of pilings, some 4,500 of them in this case. In its day, it was ultra-modern. Until the 1980s, this was Amsterdam's main post office. Now, it's a mall, housing 40 stores. This wide, busy street doesn't really seem to fit the city. That's because it's new. Well, from the 1880s. Built atop a paved-over canal. Scan the facades. Are you drunk or high? Or in Amsterdam, where buildings settle. Nice line of gables, both along the busy street and down Molsteg. Look up and notice hooks above warehouse doors. This was the typical merchant's design. Shop on the ground floor, living space in the middle, and storage up in the attic. Houses lean out on purpose, so you can hoist up cargo without bouncing things on the wall. Torrenslaus Bridge The houses crowd together, shoulder to shoulder. They're built atop thousands of logs hammered vertically into the marshy soil to provide a foundation. Over the years, They've shifted with the tides, leaving some leaning this way and some leaning that. Notice that some of the brick houses have iron rods strapped onto the sides. These act like braces, binding the bricks to an inner skeleton of wood. Almost all Amsterdam houses have big, tall windows to let in as much light as possible. Although some houses look quite narrow, most of them extend far back. The rear of the building, called the actor house, is often much more spacious than you might expect from the facade. Real estate has always been expensive on this canal, and owners were taxed by the amount of street frontage. It was especially expensive for homes with a wide facade and minimum usable space in back. The single canal is just one of Amsterdam's many canals. All told, there are roughly 50 miles of them. Most are about 10 feet deep. Canals originated as a way to drain diked-off marshland. As the city grew, they also became part of the city's sewer system. They were flushed daily by opening the locks as the North Sea tides came in and out. Continue west on Odelelystraat. Odelelystraat, Odelelely, Odelelely, Odelelely. Rick, wrong country. Decorating the rooftops are Amsterdam's famous gables, or false fronts. Gables come in all shapes and sizes. They might be ornamented with human and animal heads, garlands, urns, scrolls, and curlicues. Despite the infinite variety, there are a few distinct types. This is part of the so-called Homo Monument, Amsterdam's AIDS memorial. If you survey the square, you'll see that the pink triangle is just one of three triangles between here and the church. These are contained in a single large triangle that comprises the Homo Monument. The pink triangle design reclaims the symbol that the Nazis used in concentration camps to label homosexuals. And it's also a reminder of the persecution gay people still experience today. For now, look up at the towering spire of the impressive Vesterkirk. The crown shape was a gift of the Habsburg Emperor Maximilian I. As a thanks for a big loan, the city got permission to use the Habsburg royal symbol. The tower also displays the symbol of Amsterdam with its three X's. The Vesterkirk, or Western Church, was built in 1631 as the city was expanding out from Dom Square. Rembrandt's buried inside, but no one knows where. 
During World War II, the Vesterkirk's carillon played every day. This hopeful sound reminded Anne Frank, who hid out just down the street, that there was, indeed, an outside world. That's the Tower of the Westerkirk. Mother hates the bells, but I love them. They remind me of the outside. Houseboaters can plug hoses and cables into outlets along the canals to get water and electricity. Note the canal traffic. The official speed limit on canals is about four miles per hour. At night, boats must have running lights on the top, the side, and in the stern. Most boats are small and low, designed to glide under the city's bridges. The Prinzengracht Bridge is average height, with less than seven feet of headroom. That headroom varies with the water level. Some bridges have less than six feet. Boaters need good maps to tell them the height of the bridges, which is crucial for navigating. Police boats roam on the lookout for boaters' DUI. Welcome to the quiet Jordan. Built in the 1600s as a working-class housing area, it's now home to artists and yuppies. As you walk west along Egelantier's Canal, check out the boats. Junky old boats litter the canal. Some aren't worth maintaining and are left abandoned. As these dinghies fill with rainwater and start to rot, the city confiscates them and stores them in a big lot. Unclaimed boats are auctioned off three times a year. But most boats are well used, and even the funkiest scows can become cruising love boats when the sun goes down. The black door is marked St. Andreeshof, 107 TM 145. The doorway looks private, but it's the public entrance to a set of residences. You'll walk into a tiny garden courtyard surrounded by a dozen or so residences. Take a seat on a bench. This is one of the city's scores of courtyards called Hofjes, similar to Amsterdam's much larger Begeinhof. These are subsidized residences built around a courtyard funded by churches, charities, and the city for low-income widows and pensioners. And this is where our tour ends, in a tranquil world that seems right out of a painting by Vermeer.